Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Is anybody watching the game right now? Okay, cool. Don't tell us. Just put. Just, all right. No one thank tells you. anyone the score that. all day. Sweet. <laughs> The first poem that ever wrote me was penned in 2001. I was a high school junior, noticing a paradigmatic and personnel shift on my block. Our same old hood trauma and triumph was met with new neighbors, escalating rents, and what was, at that time, a barely noticeable cultural transition. I documented the present and imagined the future of my West Oakland block, shared that poem at a Youth Speaks Teen Poetry Slam, use it as my college entrance essay, paraphrase it for a Newsweek article, and this poem wrote me into a life of artistry. I attended New York University as an undergrad. My advisor was Daniel Banks, who was trying his damnedest to create an aperture in academia wide enough to fit a curriculum on hip hop theater and performance studies. Around the same time, I was asked to help get a fledging You Speaks Madison off the ground. A plucky organizer there, Willie Nay, was attempting to create space in the region and ultimately at the, four, at the local four-year institution to create a pathway to true diversity in higher education and also a route for young arts practitioners to gain credentials in their craft. At the same time, I was offered a seat at the table within the Future Aesthetics cohort, as convened by La Doña, Roberta Uno, alongside Camila Forbes, Clyde Valentin, James Cass, Mark Joseph, Paul Flores, Seta Guetta, Quick and Rock, Jeff Chang, everyone. At this table, I began to see myself as an artist for the second time in my career, in the company not just of the folks who created work that moved me, but also in the midst of artists at the brink of newness, folks who had yet to understand the reach, impact, and power they'd wield in 10 years time. It is a particular privilege to be able to study the folks you admire on a Thursday and be able to put their collective theory into praxis on a Friday. I'd sit with Daniel and unpack a willpower play. Then I'd leave an interim meeting where Clyde Valentine discussed his hopes for the Hip Hop Theater Festival Bay Area. I'd take a weekend trip and end up at UW-Madison teaching the young folks who would become the first cohort of First Wave. My privilege is not lost on me. I know that it was not happenstance, rather quite intentional. I am the fruit of a collective labor the crop of a creative ecosystem designed to allow the next generation to speak for itself. For the sake of this conversation, I started coming of age as an artist around 26. My son, who is now 14, was four months old when I first met our convener, Roberta Uno. Um, and I'd say that the framework then was the choreography of representation. How do we get all these talented bodies aligned? And what force must we use to take our narratives to the center special in the theaters, in the galleries, and in the centers? In 2016, I wear my Hamilton t-shirt to a poetry reading at Georgia Tech. Um, there are 18-year-old freshmen and 70-something-year-old professors who greet me after the show with generous mumbling about my poems and then wide, open, sincere curiosity. Yo, can you get me a ticket? <laughs> On a southern campus full of elite young engineers and biotechnologists in training, every color, creed, and stripe loves a hip hop Broadway musical. Most have never seen it. Hamilton is the theater's version of the bootleg recording your cousin sent you of Red Alert's uh, Midnight Set on Kiss FM in 1983. It is not from your city, but you know this music by heart and you want to represent. Kendrick performed a hip hop theater piece with fire and West African dance at the Grammys. We elected Obama in 08 and survived long enough to watch him go to Cuba in 2016 and marriage equality and we got Hamilton. So we won, right? <laughs> by those tropes of representation, isn't this what our victory was supposed to look like? So let's begin with the truth that this has never just been about representation, though it's always been a meaningful metric. And clearly, Oscar's still so white, and fucking girls, really, Lena Dunham, through what white magic did you presage and manifest the disappearance of black people from Brooklyn? However. <laughs> the conversation that we entered as artists and educators at the turn of this century was never just about representation, but about accountability, um, about we as living legacy. 
a relationship to the social contract as played out through artistic curation, intentional pedagogy, and land stewardship, liberation theology. What do uh, the young poets say all the time? Get free. The question 15 years ago was who gets to make theater? Who gets to make the season? But perhaps today's question has learned from mistakes and raised the stakes. So we now ask who gets to make the city in an era of resegregation? Who gets to make a new world and how? Well, here we are undivorced from our other selves. We are in our bodies as artists, as children of migration, and as staff at this place. You can imagine that YBCA's position to work like many cultural institutions, connecting to its environment through the primacy of its own aesthetics, driven by a mission to provide socially engaging content, less than intentionally impacting its social environment through active energetic reciprocity. But when we were hired here, no one mandated us to stop being ourselves. Everything we are is everywhere we've been. So that doesn't just mean that we could continue to make objects like dances or plays or poems. It means that from an administrative perch, we apply an artist's thinking to curation, engagement, and administration. And the real life mission of this place that we're supposed to administer is generate culture that moves people with a ridiculously talented staff, with a particularly intuitive leader, make culture. Not harbor it, not watch it go by. Generate culture. Remap's ambition is to systematize an ongoing dialogue between a network of culture makers, and YBCA shares that ambition. We invest resources in a consistent relationship to alternative narratives and stakeholdership in answering macro social questions. So what happens when you've been trained in dialogue and creative, inclusive community investment alongside the people in this room and can't get their voices out of your head? What questions are you then responsible to answer as you and your team begin pulling the levers of a place like this? You ask, can we imagine the artistic curation of community activation? Is it possible to pedagogically choreograph social justice? YBCA asks itself, can we design a social practice built on the instigations of a curated few? Can we manage the life cycle of an idea, build an ecosystem of creative individuals to respond to that idea, nurture those responses with artistic interactions, and then harvest the results in the form of public policy? Consider the life cycle of a law. Imagine it cynically and insinuate that few ideas become law nowadays without first being tampered with by moneyed interests. Mm -hmm. That said, perhaps the only thing more powerful than private funds is public will. When YBCA describes its mission as generating culture that moves people, the bet that we're making is that we can activate how art influences the public imagination, that we can actually design a process whereby highly dynamic inquiry spawns culture. And as Jeff Chang so eloquently distills, culture precedes policy. So our new curatorial design begins with the belief that social change begins with the artists that are asking the right catalytic questions and we can organize our community to refine, reframe, and respond to those questions in a way that can seduce the public will. We do this in six parts. As a staff, members, board, we nominate and decide upon a list of culture makers that we call the YBCA 100. We bring key members of this group together in a summit that looks like this. Welcome to your Buena Center for the Arts. I want you to consider the life cycle of a question as nurtured by a cultural incubator. Our job here is to make social incubators for creative change. We need more and different kinds of people gathering around those deep poetic questions. Pretty much the most important part of what we're going to do today is going to be the moment where we turn it over to you. We invite you to participate, and subsequently we ask you to invite others. 
a question comes into your head, a problem comes into your head. What happens when we don't change hearts? How does the body wear trauma? What is it that you really believe that the institution needs to be in order to be viable, uh, a viable entity to the society in which it serves? How do you break through? the shutdown, the, the disembodiment, the disengagement that happens. How would curbing food waste better prepare us to face the challenges of climate change? The job of the artist in this day and age is to put people into positions where they can actually feel and experience in their own body what you're trying to communicate. If we don't change us, we don't change the world. Who do we need to be? Uh, so that was last October. Mm -hmm. um, we will convene our next YBCA 100 in November of 2016. I invite you guys to come through. Um, from all the questions that were um, expressed at our last event, our staff got together and um, essentially distilled them down to three. And these questions then become the prism through which we do our curatorial work for um, the next 12 to 18 months. So what we're asking ourselves right now is can we design freedom? What does equity look like? And why citizenship? We solicit responses to these questions from our multiple publics, and we eventually invite 90 YBCA fellows to undergo a year's worth of curated experience and meetings. Over the course of that year, our fellows break down into small working groups and use YBCA curated events and curated artists as a complicating ground to digest the inquiry in an art-framed way. Today on campus, we'll have um, 30 YBCA Freedom Fellows who are answering our first question, can we design freedom? Um, we'll also have about uh, 65 different artists um, creating or expressing through 29 different projects all throughout YBCA's campus um, responses to the questions, uh, what is a healthy ecosystem and why work? Um, these questions were distilled from the previous year's um, YBCA 100 process, so you can um, see how this is working. Um, what's, uh, what you're seeing here are responses to one of our prototyped um, uh, YBC 100 process. Um, we brought Young Jean Lee here who asked us um, what's on the other side of your body's joy and what's on the other side of your body's shame. Um, this is an image from Candace Antique Wicks and Tommy Shepard who created a song cycle about the history of black shame in response to those questions. Um, this soccer workshop happened right outside the building. Um, this is uh, Danya Cabello, who um, did an intergenerational uh, workshop um, featuring the sport that she loves in response to the question, what's on the other side of your body's joy? Um, this whole uh, kind of uh, spectrum of inquiry and response is also reflected in our Market Street Prototyping Festival where we ask very bluntly who gets to make the city or what does the future of this city's main thoroughfare look like? Um, and again, in terms of the pedagogical continuum, we have these public responses to active artistically driven questions. From public response, we move into public affirmation, where YBCA integrates the responses and the process into our brand profile to heighten the visibility of our creative ecosystem in the public imagination. So you can see our, our brand new signs are out front. We're the center for the art of doing something about it. We're the center for the art of progress. Uh, when Bamuti teaches class, we're the center for the art of yes. <laughs> 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 Which is always my favorite. <laughs> um, so if culture precedes policy, this cycle of asking, refining, prototyping, and celebrating begins to take root in the public will, impacting public and private partnerships and eventually inspiring shifts in local law. What that looks like, I don't know. I have no idea, but I can imagine. So yes, as Art Center, we bring together activists, philanthropists, artists, technologists, and humanitarians, but who we curate for our stages is based on the belief that the burning questions these people are asking are the fertile ground for the world we want to make. 
we are inviting our multiple publics to refine the questions of these instigators to essentialize them down to digestible and publicly actionable components to join us in our building and around our region in a shared exercise of art framed civic curiosity. We've talked a lot about demographics this weekend, but underneath it, our emotional conversation is asking for the elimination of the American pathology that there are a chosen few and the rest of us are just auditioning for our humanity. I speak, I write, I teach, I full-time artist, I make screenplay, I worry, less than my slightly older counterparts did about whether or not my art will be seen. I went to LA, got an MFA. I dreamt audacious enough to start seeing myself and us on screen. I'm old to the kids now. At 31, I find myself still the youngest in most rooms, still at a table designed for equity and visibility, still in the company of the same relative personnel. But time has shifted the meaning and impact of our work. Youth Speaks turns 20 today. Q-tip is at the Kennedy Center. Clyde is at SMU. High Arts has a brick and mortar on the Upper East Side. Jeff and Jerome are at Stanford. Alternate Roots has provided strategies for survival in Mississippi. Favi's reached internationally, international acclaim. Mark, Deb, and I are here. And Roberta has made, yet again, a home for us all inside of Art Change Us. We have become, yeah, we can clap for that. For sure. <laughs> We have become in so many ways the institutions we wanted to be in the early aughts. We fought for visibility and equity with our blue-haired legacy counterparts. Tonight, we rock the symphony hall. Mark's writing opera, Hamilton, Hamilton, Hamilton. We fought for access and we won. But also, we know that the stakes have changed. We have more visibility than ever, but in a Twitter amplified world, we also have more static through which to cut. All it takes is a roll call, bland, brown, Garner, Grant, to remind that yes, we are further than we hoped, but we're still a long way out. We remind ourselves that we have already witnessed shift in public policy, that we collectively are directly responsible for changing the landscape of the field, for charting the shifting demographics, and for making the art irresistible, and one that draws the right folks to the table for the right conversations. It is imperative, imperative that we work now work thoughtfully and build a model that allows us to pool the resources of our collective institutions and leverage it against a system designed, obviously, to kill us. We offer an idea, a program structure that moves intentionally from inquiry to impact. Our adversaries have designed systems that effectively incarcerate us and deport us. We are literally wondering aloud, can we design freedom? We don't claim to have the answer, but like Art Change Us, we're going to keep asking the probing questions until the resolution comes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, we're going to open up for questions, comments, feedback, criticisms. We're going to ask that um, you use the microphone so that the live stream audience um, can also hear. Um, they're giving a woot woot hands up. So what up, live stream? We love you. Any questions, concerns, response? No? Call and response community. We have a question from, it looks like, Dalak Brathwaite. The wrath of the Brathwaite. Y'all still inspire me. I just wanted to say that. Word. Thanks, right. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, <laughs> okay, Carlton looks like he has a question. Thank you for your presentation and for the work that you're doing here at YBCA. Um, so looking at the trajectory of the process from bringing in the people in the community to engaging these questions that will lead to uh, the change in policy, uh, what I've seen in, in my community in Mississippi is that even the cultural shift that happens, uh, if we're not working also to put people in positions of power and decision-making spaces, that the, that the community can be um, rendered you know, irrelevant in terms of the decisions that happen that are not in connection to the culture of the community. So how does that also play into your ecosystem? 
Oh, sweet. Yeah. Play your <laughs> <plus>. <laughs> I, I, I get the softball. <laughs> um, I taught high school when I was 21, and um, I, I remember going home thinking that um, I failed the kids in my classroom. Um, this happens, I think, to many educators, to many of us that struggle on a, on a daily basis. You're not, just, you're not having um, the greatest day. Um, then maybe five years or 10 years um, later, you come across those same kids that are in the classroom and find them thriving. Um, you run into a person like or, or maintain a relationship with um, someone like this person who I met, I think, at first when you were 16. 14. Young. <laughs> younger. Um, and, I, and Carlton, I respond in that way because um, I, I don't think that we can actually systematize the results. Um, I think that what we can do is lay a platform for inclusivity and collective vision um, and proceed with some faith and also some direction that the leverage that we achieve, the, the cultural magnitude of the work um, is like a wave, to use another um, Jeff Chang metaphor that's clearly my mentor <laughs> in all things like socially progressive. But yeah, to actually operate um, in, this, in this way where the sheer physics of the public imagination is what um, um, sweeps the entire community um, into our, um, our systemic ambitions. I would also say that I was moved by the idea that Piper would share space with us yesterday and with, with you on that panel, and I think there's something to be said for creating space where folks of color, young folks of color, can see that sort of visibility as well. Um, folks of color from their neighborhood policing, folks of color from their neighborhood in positions of power at a city level, um, at a state level. So we're hoping that we make YBCA um, not just a home for uh, creative civic action, but also civic civic action. Mm -hmm. I, I would say maybe as a, as a final component that we have a chief of civic engagement. His name is Jonathan Moscone. We work with local members of um, the YBCA 100 um, and, as, and through our prototyping festival to um, essentially curate these strategic partnerships to land these um, public, land these responses in the public realm in different ways. So it's, since we're really just kind of um, at the beginning of the process, um, it'll be interesting to see um, how these responses land outside of this physical space um, and what the response um, and instigation for inclusivity looks like. The last bit I'd say is that our Freedom Fellows, our Fellows groups in general, aren't restricted to artists, but are inclusive of tastemakers, policymakers, and, and elected officials. Question over there. Wait, we need to get a microphone to you. Oh, there's one, there's two over there, my bad. Thank you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's so nice, we got two people of color trying to figure out who's gonna speak first. <laughs> uh, uh, Age before beauty. Um, <laughs> I, I would just wanted to ask, speaking of inclusivity, um, you know, I, I know the field has talked or used the metaphor of an ecosystem actually for a really long time, but real ecosystems in nature are um, extremely complex yes. and sustainable. Mm -hmm. I feel like what we have built as humans in this, in this cultural realm isn't really very sustainable. And we also have all kinds of spaces now that we have built all over the place and it's not clear how they should be used or continue to be used or who has access to them. And actually a lot of, a lot of different things about the landscape that, that we work in. And also the one that we think in and that we live in and believe in. So I'm wondering if within the folks that you're inviting into this discussion, if you're thinking about inviting scientists um, and evolutionary psychologists, and I'm you know, thinking about unconscious bias and all kinds of things that really impact um, the things that we are making and creating and reacting to. 
yes and, yes and. So the first thing I'd say that um, next door today as part of our field of inquiry at our public square, we're actually presenting the real life ecosystems as well. So you can see that modeled in our work. So you can see um, a, a creative and um, nature friendly walk through San Francisco, hear bird calls and see those uh, replicated by a cellist in our front door gallery. But beyond that, yes, we have someone who works at NASA as part of our Freedom Fellows group. We have someone who works in public law um, and public policy as a professor at UC Berkeley as part of our fellows group. So our, our fellows group is pretty reflective of what we hope is a sustainable actual ecosystem in the Bay Area. You, sir, had a question? Oh, is it for me? Also, first, let me say thank you for your shared leadership and in this process of how art, creativity, and culture can really be um, the tipping point for social change. Um, my question, I work with a nonprofit organization that sits on the campus of a public high school. And so we use art um, to really take young people or really challenge young people to use art in many different ways uh, in their on-campus life. So I'm curious, where do, where do young people fit in this framework? And when I say young people, I'm specifically talking about middle and high school students. And would you folks be interested um, in creating, if it's already not in place, a model for young people to go through this same process um, using their own creative and artistic skills to challenge and think about problems that affect them every day? Yes to all that. That's the softball. Yeah. You know, oh, that, 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 those are the ones that I get. Yeah. Uh, yes to all that. Um, young people are included in our fellows. So um, for many years, we've had a program at YBCA called the Young Artists at Work, or um, YAW. Um, and for most of that time, I, th I think the, um, the mission of the program was to use the curated work here in the building to shape um, a kind of artistic development for young people. But along with um, the kind of shift in trajectory of the entire institution, we've begun to think about um, the work that we do with young people, not so much in terms of nurturing young artists, but really in terms of nurturing young activists through an art frame. So our youth fellows are going to begin responding to the same questions that the fellows who apply um, either to the prototyping festival or to the YBCA fellowship program um, undergo. So um, these young people um, meet um, twice a week, three times a week. There's actually a convening of many of them happening right now, and they'll be uh, in the space throughout the building. There's a program called Teen Force that's happening in um, the sculpture court today. Um, and it's by design and by intention that as we hold our field of inquiry, as you guys are here, that we have about 200 youth that are going to be in the building um, as well, participating in these same questions. Any other questions? Garth? Oh, in the back and then Garth. Hi, thank you so much for that really inspiring presentation. And um, so I wonder about, you know, you, you've talked about demographics and what you're talking about is a different way of thinking and organizing the arts field altogether. Um, and yet there are so many of us working in so many different ways, so many different aesthetics. Um, and so many voices jostling to be heard, truthfully, and who have waited for so long. So how do we shift that mentality of now, when can it be my turn? It's, um, you know, even in this horizontal playing field, there's so much. So how can we shift that mindset, you know? Um, how do we shift the mindset? Uh, I, I think by example, mm -hmm. I, I, I have this, memory of um, being in this space, cool, of being in this space um, my first week on the job. And um, the, way that, the way that it panned out, I pretty much had to get our season together in two weeks. Um, upon starting, no, my son just walked in. Sorry to blow his spot <laughs> but it just, just, you know, lights my world up. Okay, so, um, so I had about a week Maybe, maybe two weeks to get our season together. And I remember thinking, dag, I'm, I'm looking at this season and um, I don't have enough, I, I don't have a gay Latino choreographer in my season. Like I remember having that thought of essentially adopting what I think happens in curatorial offices all over the country, 
which is, okay, there's a, there's a demographic box that I have to check that I haven't, um, I haven't checked yet. And, and my next thought after that, after really wrestling with it for a while was, I'm not here to do what anybody else would have done in this position. I'm, I'm here to be me, which is um, why we started today just talking about our, biogra our, our biographies and kind of charting a path that begins with artistic and creative impulse and manifestation. So um, I, I think so often um, there's this kind of gravitational pull towards conventional center that um, we feel attracted to, that there's something about um, convention that has felt right, and so we want to um, adopt those practices and mores. I don't know how else to be different other than to, um, to breathe differently to actually um, manifest our personal agendas and have the courage to stick with them. I, I, don't, I don't know if there's um, a Federalist paper, <laughs> you know, I don't know if there's a, a manifesto that we could write to distribute among the field that will, um, like a magic wand, shift perception. All we can do is have the courage to be who we are. Garth had a question. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you both for continuing to be an inspiration to me, myself, colleagues at my organization, and the field in general. You just never stop, so thank you for that. Word, thank you. Um, a lot of organizations, cultural organizations, are understood by the aggregation of historically what was presented in those platforms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those the, those are the cultural products <clears throat> that those platform that those organizations have been the platform for. Mm -hmm. Now, all of those organizations are in the for mission sector. They're not just in the not-for-profit sector. So they were started for a particular purpose to have an effect in the world. So if people's understanding is based on the product over a long period of time and the purpose or the mission so far in the background, what I'm seeing here and trying to emulate is that you are being super intentional and transparent about the process and manifesting it as something that people can see, be invited into, and participate in. Yes. So a profoundly and radically different product, if you will, or experience is playing out on this particular platform. Mm -hmm. So different than what we often think about cultural organizations as being a platform for. <clears throat> what experience do we go to such and such a theater for? It's to see a show in that theater. Yes. But that's not what I saw here. Yeah. Yeah. So can you please speak a little bit to your experience of confronting the challenges, expected and unexpected, of doing something so profoundly different in a space where people thought they understood what was supposed to happen there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to answer this. Okay. The, the, the <laughs> no, I'm going to drag you back here. Um, because we can come at this in, in many different ways. But the, the place where I like to start is the moment after the show. Um, because a lot of times what happens is um, you come into a theater, you see a performance, you're deeply moved, you're, you know, you're, you're inspired. And then what? You know? So part of the design of this process is to use that moment of inspiration or to anticipate the moment of inspiration and to transpose it in time to a year before the show or a year and a half before the show and to gather thinkers that are responding to the same questions that the theater maker was responding to in making the work. So today, um, folks are responding to questions of labor and ecology in the same way that Grisha Coleman is. So the idea is you don't see Grisha Coleman's show and then say, wow, that was terrible or that was amazing or that was whatever it is that you feel. Um, you, you actually um, 
um, identify and articulate the questions that are driving this particular artist and you invite folks into the inquiry well in advance. It doesn't take away from um, being a center that presents artistic objects. We still present dances, and, um, but, uh, but these objects are kind of curricular, that there's an underlying and intentional learning and responding that's part of our curatorial process. Um, and then I think it's, um, it's also important to say that our cultural product is um, a changed world. Like, um, we're not doing this so that people can have a good time in the theater. That will happen. We're not doing this just so people will be moved in the galleries. That's awesome. Um, we're doing this because this is an urgent time in our, in human history. I mean, every moment has been urgent, mm -hmm. but for reasons of climate, for um, political refraction, for um, disturbing dialogue, um, and because we are the stewards of a resource like this, it would be irresponsible to do anything but um, identify a changed and more equitable and inclusive world, a, a, a community that thrives on inspiration as the cultural product. So I would say, I paused and, and made the face because I was trying to figure out how honest I could be. The hardest thing for me is to say I don't know in front of anyone. And so to say I don't know in front of a room of my colleagues on a daily basis, saying that the art that I'm making now is about curation, about designing the right people to be in the room and planning for long-term civic change. And I'm not quite sure how we're gonna get there, but we're gonna try it this time, this way, um, with our ideals, our mores, our values in place, using um, resources that we've never had before but have now, um, and we're gonna make something that works. Um, and so I, f I feel every day like, um, a mad scientist. Uh, I, I put all the right things into the, into the graduated cylinder and I know there's gonna be a reaction and I, I'm, I'm charting for the, the reaction that I'd like um, and hoping that we get there and then optimizing as we go forward. Also, I think it's just super quick. I, I think it's important to say, one, that we do this as family that um, you know, Deborah Cullinan and her leadership, the curatorial staff, the senior leadership, that, um, that we are slowly, holistically buying in. I will not say that there hasn't been tension, but we are getting there. And the iconography that we showed you earlier that appears around the neighborhood and around this building, being a center for the art of doing something about it is an outward manifestation of um, several years of inward working, but um, I, I think it's, it, it's critical to note that as artists, um, we are often sometimes in your cities um, called upon to do a workshop at LEAF, right? Like we come in and um, we perform and we do a workshop and there's so much happening and then we go. Now, um, most institutions, the majority of institutions in this room um, only bring us to these spaces as part of a larger spectrum or a larger kind of continuum. Um, and that's what makes um, the National Performance Network, for instance, so um, such a vital and viable organization is that, or, uh, or a consortium of organizations is that most of those organizations have long-term goals in terms of this kind of change. But very often, an institution will bring us in very specifically to do the work. So um, there's a problem and a show and a Q&A is supposed to solve it. So um, what we're attempting to build here is um, uh, an instrument where we can move outside of that kind of like um, hyper dynamic um, combustible moment and really think about the slow burn to create systemic change. And I'd say, finally, we're not alone. So we, we shouted out John Moscone. Lucia San Roman has just joined as our chief of visual arts. Um, Rebecca Rodriguez, also in civic engagement. I mean, our, I could name all 70 folks on our staff, but it's a dynamic group of folks who have all begun, begun to break down as a group, and I think that there's some power in that as well. We have these two last questions, and then we're gonna, we're gonna go show you guys some thanks. Uh, you guys are great. What you're doing is really wonderful. It's prompted a lot of questions in my mind um, that in some ways the project is 
about cities, the artistic speech of the city, or the, the speeches in the city, but, and this notion of citizenship is very, very central. But I guess that leads me to the question about governance and democracy yeah. and how you, or your contribution fits into these larger sort of reimaginings that I hopefully remap will lead a charge mm. on. Mm. Yes. Um, how do we get Shanaka elected? How do we get Greg Hodge elected mayor of Oakland? Is, so, it, is that what you... Like real talk, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we, we know that that's part of it as well. And we know it's a huge part of it. We're starting to tackle this and we're hoping to engage, like I said earlier, we're hoping to engage people who have their eye on public office in our process at the beginning so that it's not new once they're in office, that they're inundated and engaged from jump. But yeah, it's, that's part of the thing too. And we, that's why we have someone like Tom DeCaney here yesterday. That's why um, my father, who was also an elected official, was here in the room yesterday. So um, it's, it's we're why mindful of it. It's why we're a polling place. We're a polling so, place on it. So, yeah. you know, for folks that are um, voting in the California primary, for folks that vote in the national election, they come here to vote. Um, we understand our role in civic life and in electoral politics is tenuous because we um, we have a relationship with the city. The origins of this place come out of um, the redevelopment um, agencies here in the state of California. We are um, tethered in different ways um, to uh, political process. But I, but I, I think about um, nationally who we've elected and why, who becomes a viable um, candidate and how, um, and it absolutely goes back to this premise that um, culture awakens the public imagination in a, diff in a way that shows up, I think, in um, electoral manifestation, for better and for worse. You know, um, our, our friend Donald Trump <laughs> is- it's Not my homie. <laughs> uh, is, a viable candidate in part because, a ge because we've had a generation of reality TV that um, indicates that there is a winner or a loser at the end of every 30 minute cycle or every 60 minute cycle. So he emerges as a, as a kind of viable demagogue in this um, climate because the culture has pointed us in that direction. So. What culture are we making that then makes Shanaka a viable candidate 20 years from now? Not interested. Um, <laughs> the other thing I'd say is I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm of the generation and, and, and group that's not necessarily interested, and I think that's also what's really powerful when we talk about democracy, not in the American imagination, but in the true meaning of the word. Um, we have folks who I know don't believe in the electoral process in conversation at a polling place. Um, Take This Hammer, which we'll, we'll go see um, immediately after this session, um, is space for cultural dissenters to actually have a voice and be seen by elected officials. So we're, we're mindful of it and we're at the beginning of it, but um, we're, I think we actually are a home for, for dissent and for action. There was one final question and then we out. Yeah, um, just wanna say thank you so much for having us here. Wonderful, inspiring presentation. I come from a small institution that recently reinvented itself and I think is trying to emulate and embrace a lot of what you all are trying to do. And so my question, um, I just heard our executive director talk a lot about the pushback and the resistance and the kind of um, challenges that you know, she and the rest of the board and the staff had had to overcome. And I'm really uh, pretty ignorant about the center, truthfully, and I would just love to learn a little bit more about um, your process of change, the challenges you face, the resistance, and how you address those problems as you've started this really amazing process. And thank you. Thanks. Um, that calls for a very sh strong adult beverage <laughs> over, t over time. We, yeah. We, yeah. Um, I, um, I, was, I was having a conversation with a trusted friend the other day and um, happened to look on the wall and I saw a, um, an image in a frame. And we were talking about how people perceive, um, how, how people perceive this space. And I said, you know, people can look at this square that's on the wall and um, know that you're supposed to 
kind of um, put an image in it and hang it on the wall and that's how they use it. But someone else might take the same square and put it on their head and be like, this is my hat. This is a fly hat. And in many ways, this is all about conditioning, how we take different shapes, how we take different objects, and how we relate to those objects. I, um, the, you know, maybe you've had the experience of reaching into your pocket and there are two identically um, textured um, pieces of fabric in your pocket, and one is a $1 bill and one's a $5 bill, and, but they're really just kind of random pieces of paper. We've assigned value to these things. We have been conditioned to assign value. So I think most of us, and this speaks maybe to um, Garth's question too, I think most of us have been conditioned to approach a place like this in a particular way and have gotten into this gig very specifically to apply that conditioning in, in real time. Um, so it is hard to uncondition or recondition or retexture um, arts professionals to think about um, cultural product or cultural progress as the ultimate product of our labor. Um, I think this is why we work. So in response to the question that's happening uh, uh, across the street, why work, we work so that um, the next generation can speak for itself. Like that's, you know, that's a real thing. Now, um, we can talk about the intricacies of that in an unamplified space. <laughs> um, so the next thing we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna walk over to our other building, to GFB, and the Director of Visual Arts, the Chief of Visual Arts here um, at YBCA, Lucia San Roman, is gonna talk us through um, two of the shows that are up in our galleries. Um, Take This Hammer will be the primary, and then we also invite you to see Samara Golden. From there, we'll go as a group and see the Brisha Coleman visual installation, which is the counterpart to the show you saw last night. And then we'll have maybe some time for questions. We'll be back in this room at 3.30 for an invitation um, from Carlton and James. And that will be our day. Um, thank you so much, guys. Well, um, it'll, oh, it'll, 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 almost, it'll, almost, it'll be the end of our day. It'll almost be the end of our day. After that, at, at four o'clock, after we close formally here, um, everything that we've been talking about is manifested in um, the public square that begins at four o'clock. So one of the reasons why um, we describe this process to you in this way and plan for this in this way is so that um, you can get a sense of what we're trying to build. So we strongly encourage you to come over between four and five o'clock before um, many of you go to the You Speak Slam um, tonight. Um, finally, just in this moment, um, I, I think we should just call out um, the the family that's um, on staff at Arts Change Us. Yes. So if you don't mind, if you could just like throw a fist up if you're here. Um, I see Kapena over there. Kapena Alapa, can you? Yeah. Sweet. Down in front, right down in front is our homie Daniela Alvarez. Sweet. The homie, the stromy, uh, Dallas, Texas's own. Uh, Kristen Calhoun is right there. Uh, I don't see him, but uh, maybe he's out there. Kainoa. Kainoa is yeah, right there. Also Kainoa right and in Barthe, front, no right doubt. in front and right in front. Um, in the wings, telling me I'm running way over his time. Is Toran Moore. Sue! <laughs> Guru of Logistics, Hotel Information, Registration, and Minutia. Give it up for Namiko Uno. Sweet, sweet. Uh, my homie Elizabeth Webb and I were backstage making all things happen with visuals. There she goes, there she goes, there she goes. Um, before we call out LaDonia, I want to call out two folks on our staff that have made this day possible, specifically Jody Fetter. Yes. I don't know if she's here, but we can clap for her. Yes. As well as Maya Rosal. Yeah. Cool. And then finally, but certainly not least, La Doña, the one who brought us into the room, the head of all the five families, Mrs. Roberta. <laughs> Donatella. <laughs> <laughs> all right, y'all, thanks again for taking this time um, to be introduced to the day on Saturday. We'll be back here at 3.30, but we'll see you across the way right well, now. Well, how about we take a three minute bio break and then I'll meet you here and I'll walk you over to the gallery. Cool. Meet you right out front of the theater. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks guys.